Alumni, students, and friends, I would like to welcome you all here for this exciting evening. My name is Stephanie Young, and I am the CFO of BASES, the Business Association of Stanford Entrepreneurial Students. We are thrilled to be co-sponsoring this evening's program with the Stanford Law School. Just as context for our organization, BASIS is at the heart of student entrepreneurship at Stanford, working with thought leaders, prominent professors, and investors to unite the worlds of academia and industry. As one of the most established student entrepreneurship organizations in the world, we bring together exceptional undergraduate and graduate students from across campus, from the Department of Humanities to the School of Engineering, who have one common interest to tackle the world's most exciting problems through innovation and design thinking by learning from the most successful technology companies and founders in the Silicon Valley. One of our 10 programs is the BASIS Challenge, Stanford's premier entrepreneurial competition that enables Stanford-affiliated startups to present their ventures to industry leaders for their share of $100,000 in prize money and mentorship opportunities. We're also excited to grow our Hackspace program, which aims to accelerate the growth of the hacker community, both within BASES and Stanford, through our weekly hacking hours and technical workshops. For more information to get involved with our, with our organization, please visit bases.stanford.edu. Now a few housekeeping items I wanted to mention. As you get ready to start our program, please turn your phones to silent, but don't put them too far out of reach. Later in the program, Peter will be taking questions from all of you. You can tweet your, tweet your questions for Peter using the hashtag TLStanford. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dean Elizabeth McGill of Stanford Law School. Dean McGill is the Richard E. Lang Professor of Law and the law school's 13th dean. Before coming to Stanford, she was on the faculty at the University of Virginia School of Law for 15 years, serving most recently as vice dean. Dean McGill teaches administrative law, constitutional law, and food and drug law. After completing her BA in history at Yale University, Dean McGill served as a senior legislative assistant for US Senator Kent Conrad. She left the Hill to attend the University of Virginia School of Law. After graduating, Dean McGill clerked for Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson III of the US Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, and then for US Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Please join me in welcoming Dean Elizabeth McGill. Well, welcome. In the spring of 2012, Blake Masters, who was then a law student at Stanford, did something fairly unusual for law students, although not so unusual at Stanford. He enrolled in a computer science class, CS183, and he took extremely good notes. Blake generously shared those notes with others, also a bit unusual for law students, posting them on Tumblr, and eventually he received 2.4 million page views. Why was there so much interest in this computer science class? The class was taught by our guest tonight, Peter Thiel, who was by then recognized as almost certainly the most successful technology investor in the world. Peter grew up right here on the peninsula in Foster City. He attended college at Stanford where he studied philosophy and biology. He then went to Stanford Law School, and though he moved away from the law after clerking and working at a firm, I do like to think that law school encouraged his skeptical and contrarian habit of mind and his constant questioning of conventional wisdom. Not one for modest goals, Peter Thiel first gained attention for his attempt to replace the US dollar by starting PayPal in 1998, which unquestionably changed the way payments work and made it possible for hundreds of thousands of small businesses to thrive on the internet. After taking PayPal public and selling it to eBay in 2002, he found himself referred to as the leader of the Mafia. This is a label that in this case is one he embraced. The PayPal Mafia have gone on to start some of the most innovative companies of our time, including SpaceX, Tesla, LinkedIn, YouTube, Yelp, and Yammer. In 2004, Peter himself co-founded Palantir Technologies, a data analytics company here in Palo Alto that makes tools for national security and global finance, and he made the first outside investment in a project then led by a Harvard sophomore known as the Facebook. Ten years later, Palantir is valued at more than $9 billion, and as you may know, the company formerly known as the Facebook turned out to be a pretty good bet. 
Today, as a partner at Founders Fund and in his own investing, Peter works to identify and support the next generation of technology companies. But he's more than just a genius creating value and building companies. Uh, he is a generous and well-known philanthropist, and he is more than that. As Fortune magazine recently put it, Peter has, quote, drawn upon his wide-ranging and idiosyncratic readings in philosophy, history, economics, anthropology, and culture to become perhaps America's leading public intellectual today. Most recently, with the help of his former student, Blake Masters, and those very famous class notes, Peter has reworked the material from CS 183 into a remarkable book, Zero to One, Notes on Startups or How to Build the Future. This is the book he's talking about tonight. So please get, join me in giving Peter Thiel a warm welcome. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. I always feel it's so hagiographic. It can only go downhill uh, from, from there. And it's always a tremendous privilege to come back to Stanford. Uh, this is where I feel my whole, uh, my whole uh, career, my whole life uh, after high school really began. Uh, and this is also where this book, Zero to One, started uh, two, two years ago uh, out of this class. And, uh, and one, of the, you know, one of the challenges about teaching entrepreneurship or, uh, or writing about it um, is that I think that, that, that uh, the way people normally go about doing this uh, is in one, one of several ways I think don't quite work. So one, one approach would be that you would just tell people stories about your own experiences. And so I'd, I could spend the whole evening talking about uh, what I did at PayPal in 1998, 99, um, you know, how we combined email with money. And, and it's sort of all very idiosyncratic. Um, and it's, it's, it's maybe there's some fun war stories, but you can't really generalize from that too much. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have all these attempts to teach things where it's, uh, where it's basically like the, sort of a formula. It's, um, it's you follow these five steps, and you will be able to, to build a successful company. And I think the, the problem is that, um, that business, um, it's, it, there's, no, it's, there's no formula, there's no science. And so these things end up being sort of very pseudo-scientific. And it's because I think Every moment in the history of business happens only once. Uh, the next Bill Gates will not build an operating system. The next uh, Larry Page won't build a search engine. The next Mark Zuckerberg will not be building a social network. If you are copying uh, these people, you're in some sense uh, not learning from them. Um, and, uh, and so the point of departure for uh, my, my class and for the Zero to One book is this um, idea of the the, the uniqueness of all, all these great companies and, um, and how what's, uh, what's truly important and valuable is, um, is extremely unique. Um, and I, I try to get at this, uh, I try to get at this uh, through sort of a series of contrarian kinds of questions. One, one sort of question is always like, what great business is nobody building? There's a more intellectual version of it, uh, which I always like to ask as an interview question. And it's, tell me something that's true that almost nobody agrees with you on. And uh, this turns out to be a shockingly hard question for people to answer. And it's, uh, and it's hard because, uh, for one thing, it's hard because tr we've just been taught that truth is uh, conventional, that truth is whatever everybody agrees on. And so coming up with something new that people don't already agree on uh, puts us in a very uncomfortable sort of a place. It sounds like it's really hard to do this. Uh, and so you have to be really, really brilliant, or so we, so we think. But the other reason it's a very um, tough question to answer is because if you sort of think about the literal dynamic of an interview where, where I'm asking the question to somebody, um, and then if, if you give me an answer, and it's like, oh yeah, I already thought that, or I agreed with that, that's the wrong answer. And so the, the right answer is one that in some sense uh, people might not agree with. And so it, I think it often requires quite a bit of courage to to come up with um, with an answer that uh, that people haven't thought of, and we're often sort of intimidated from uh, from thinking through these things. And so, um, I want to today uh, maybe give um, in my brief remarks, I'll just give three answers to this question. And in some ways, my zero to one book, it's like a whole series of of things that I believe to be true that I think most people uh, don't agree with. And um, and I'm going to give you three answers uh, three answers to this question tonight. Um, first answer um, that I, I believe, and this is uh, this sort of follows from the uniqueness of these companies, is I think that um, 
Um, in the opening sentence of Anna Karenina is that all happy families are alike, all unhappy families are unhappy in their own uh, special way. And, um, and I think the opposite is true of business. I think all happy companies are different. They're doing something unique. All unhappy companies are alike because they fail to escape uh, the essential sameness of competition. And the, the sort of the, you know, the, 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 when the Wall Street Journal excerpted that chapter in my book, uh, the chapter's entitled, All Happy Companies Are Different. They, uh, they retitled it as, uh, Competition is for Losers, which um, um, is, is kind of a, uh, um, kind of a sort of got people's attention. And it's, and it's, of course, because we normally believe the opposite. We believe that the losers are the people who don't compete intensely enough. And so you're a loser if you're not competitive or uh, not really competing, but um, not that you're a loser if you're somehow too obsessed with competing, because if you're too focused on competing, maybe you're losing sight of what's, what's really important. And, um, and the, sort of, uh, the sort of way I articulate this is that I think the, the most important distinction in business that people don't talk about enough is that there are two kinds of companies in this world. There are companies that are competitive and there are companies that have monopolies. If you're a one-of-a-kind company, a happy company that's doing something different, you are a monopoly. It is the goal of every founder, of every entrepreneur. It should be their goal to try to build a, uh, a monopoly business. Um, and, um, and so, or to frame this as, as a sort of an unconventional truth, most people believe that capitalism and competition are synonyms, um, and I believe capitalism and competition are antonyms. I believe that a capitalist um, is someone who's in the business of accumulating capital. A world of perfect competition is a world where all the profits are competed away. Um, and so the, 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 the example I sort of use throughout um, of, of a bad type of business to go into is opening a restaurant which is super competitive, and nobody ever makes any money doing it. Um, and, uh, and then the other end of the spectrum, we have all these sort of fantastic uh, tech companies that have been built in Silicon Valley, and sort of the, the, the example of a fantastic monopoly business I give is, is Google, which basically has had no competition in search since 2002, when it definitively distanced itself from uh, Microsoft and Yahoo, and it's been making enormous profits for uh, the dozen years or so uh, ever since. And so. Uh, you want to be in the monopoly. You do not want to be in the in the world of uh, competition. The the difference is, um, I think this difference is not understood for for a variety of reasons. Um, one of them is that. Uh, 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 people always distort it. So if you're running a monopoly, you normally don't talk about it. You, you learn not to talk about it. Um, and you avoid talking about it normally by pretending that you're in a much larger market. So Google would never say that it's a search engine. It would say it's a technology company. It's competing with Apple on cell phones, and it's competing with Facebook on social, and Amazon, and Microsoft. And it's going to be competing with the car companies with its self-driving car. And it's in this big, big space called technology, and there's just competition everywhere. Um, and conversely, if you're running um, a super competitive business and you're trying to raise money for it, you want to tell people some unique differentiated story. So if you're trying to open a restaurant in Palo Alto and the investors tell you, well, I don't want to invest in that because restaurants are bad and I will just lose all my money, you'll say something like, well, this is a unique restaurant. It's totally different from all the others. It's the only British food restaurant in Palo Alto. And, um, and, of, course, um, and of course, that's sort of a fictional, a fictional sub-market because it's uh, quite possible that um, there are no people who eat nothing but British food. And so you're still competing with other restaurants um, and maybe even some in Menlo Park and maybe some in uh, Mountain View because people might actually drive a few miles or something like that. And, um, and so it's, again, this uh, you tell a story where the market's fictionally too small. And so the people who don't have monopolies pretend to have them. The people who have monopolies pretend not to have them. The apparent difference is, is quite small. The real difference is, is really big. So, um, so that's sort of intellectually why we, we don't understand this monopoly question. Um, I think there's also a psychological uh, part of this as well, though, that's uh, that's uh, very subtle, but I think is uh, very important to understand, um, where um, we, we sort of are taught that um, uh, competition is valuable. And there sort of is this, this uh, safety in crowds, that if a lot of people are trying to uh, get something, it must be a good thing to do. It's like the, if there's a long line of people waiting uh, to get in somewhere, you just get in line. You don't even ask why why people are standing in line. And, um, and we, we sort of. 
Um, and so we, you know, and the, there is sort of like this uh, psychology um, where, you know, already, you know, already in the time of Shakespeare, the word ape meant both primate and to imitate. And there is something about human nature that's ape-like, sheep-like, lemming-like, herd-like. We're attracted to these things where a lot of other people are doing them. This is, you know, I think this, this is always a, a challenge with a lot of the ways we're taught in school and we're educated where um, you're taught to compete for all the same credentials. Uh, if you're on an athletic team in high school or college, uh, you're competing on things there. Um, the competition has the effect of definitely making you better at that at which you're competing. So if you spend you know, years prepping for an SAT test, you'll get better at taking the SAT test. Or if you're on a swim team, uh, in high school, you'll get better at swimming because you're focused on beating the people around you. But um, it always sort of comes at this price of, um, of possibly losing sight of uh, broader questions, of questions of what's really valuable or what's really important. There's a, there's a crazy uh, a line from Henry Kissinger uh, talking about his sort of fellow faculty members at Harvard where he said, you know, the battles in academia are so ferocious because the stakes are so small. And, and this always, um, it always seems like, well, this is sort of like a formula for insanity. Why would, the, why would the battles be so ferocious? And if the stakes are small, there's no real need to fight. Um, and so it's just sort of like describing some sort of mass insanity. But, um, but on another level, it's also, I think, describing the, uh, the inner logic of a situation where if the stakes are small, if the differences are small, you have to fight much harder to differentiate yourself. And the competition gets more and more intense. Um, and, um, and, and, so, uh, and so we end up with these dynamics where everyone tries to go through the same tiny door when maybe there's a huge gate uh, just around the corner that nobody wants to, no, nobody wants to explore. And I think that's, that's sort of the dynamic we're always up against. Um, there's, a, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a version of this phenomenon in Silicon Valley where, um, where uh, it's sort of a strange way in which there are a lot of people who seem to have Asperger's or something like that that seem to do really, really well in, um, in all these companies. And I always think this should be turned around as a, as a critique of our society, where what does it say about our society where anyone who's well adapted socially um, is talked out of all of their original ideas before they're even fully formed because they sort of pick up all these social cues from people. Oh, that's a little bit too weird. That's strange. Nobody's done that before. Maybe you should not do this. Um, um, and, um, and so that the people who are, not, um, who are not able to understand what people around them are doing are somehow able to explore uh, some of these original ideas uh, much for further. There's this very uh, strange set of studies that's been done around Harvard, at Harvard Business School where they, uh, um, which even, and you can think of sort of business schools as consisting of the anti-Asperger profile of people. So it's people who are extremely extroverted, um, sort of hyper-social, um, often don't have any really strong convictions, but uh, I, won't, I, won't, I won't make this too sweeping a generalization. Um, and, um, and you sort of have a hothouse environment where you put all these people in one place for two years, and they sort of say, well, what do they do at the end? And uh, the conclude and um, and they sort of and and it turns out sort of at Harvard they've done these studies over 30 years now. At the end, they always go into the, the largest number always goes into the wrong field because they sort of have talked themselves into all trying to ride the last wave. So you know, 1989, everybody wanted to work for Michael Milken. This was one or two years before he went to jail. Um, no one was ever really interested in. Um, in internet or tech technology businesses except 99, 2000, just as the uh, uh, dot-com bubble was about to blow up. Uh, in the last decade, it was all sort of housing and private equity. Um, and, um, and, 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 and so there is this, you know, this, this really uh, deep dynamic where even though rationally we should avoid competition and we should aim for monopoly, psychologically we seem to always find it uh, much more comfortable to go with uh, the large crowds of people. But there is no wisdom in crowds. This, this is an anti-Malcolm Gladwell thing. There's no wisdom of crowds. Uh, it's, there's only uh, really ferocious competition. So think about this really hard. Second, um, second big picture uh, uh, contrarian thought. Um, when, when I ask this question, tell me something that's true, or how many great businesses are not being built, um, one answer people often intuitively have on this, which they don't quite articulate, but I think a lot of people have, is this sense that 
um, you know, there aren't really very many answers to this question. We've actually discovered most things, or if there are things we haven't discovered, they're super hard to figure out. And I, I sort of suggest this trichotomy of uh, three categories of uh, conventions, things that everybody already knows to be true, uh, mysteries that are almost impossibly hard to figure out, and things that are in between, which I call secrets, things that are um, hard to figure out, nobody knows yet, but if you work at it, you can, you can figure out. And um, it's my claim that um, a secret or uh, sort of some idiosyncratic body of knowledge is often at the core of all these great businesses. It's something you're very passionate about learning about. You know, in the case of PayPal, we were very interested in this question of um, cyber uh, cryptography and currency on the internet. And so we had this fantasy about building you know, a new cur the new world currency. This was our, our t-shirt. And it, it really um, sort of w it was, this, was this area we explored in, in tremendous depth. Um, and then it did actually stimulate a lot of our thinking about how to build this payment system that ultimately worked. So we, we failed to build the new world currency. We did build a you know, reasonably successful payment system. But it's sort of this, this idea that there's something you can figure out that other people uh, don't know yet. Um, and, and there are sort of certain common sense ways in which this used to be the case that's not the case anymore. If you were growing up in the 17th or 18th century, you could look at a map and there'd be some empty spaces on the map and you could say, well, who knows what's there? I could become an explorer and find out. It's a hard thing to find out. It's probably kind of dangerous to go there, but um, it's a secret you can, you can actually figure out. Um, or in the 19th century, you could sort of do basic chemistry and you could discover new elements in the periodic table of elements. And, and there's a way in which, um, obviously, geography or basic chemistry are not places where there are any secrets left. Um, and so, you know, the entire map of the world's been explored. The, uh, you know, basic chemistry's done. These are sort of closed fields. There's nothing new that you can learn in them. Um, but I think it's a mistake to extrapolate from that to, uh, to all fields. I think, um, I think there actually are many fields where there are some really interesting things left to be done. Um, we obviously have uh, all the fields around information technology where people have explored a lot in, in recent decades, computers, internet, mobile internet, that whole, that whole stream. And I I've, I've also think that we could be looking at uh, many other areas of, uh, of science and technology um, where I think the progress hasn't been quite as fast uh, but it could have been faster, and I think this is energy, transportation, biomedical, um, all sorts of, all the sort of futuristic things people thought about in the 50s and 60s that haven't been realized. And I think there is sort of this self-fulfilling aspect of this. If you think there are no secrets left to be found, then you will not be the person to find them. And, um, and if you think there are some to be found, uh, you may very well be that person. And, and there is something about uh, the way in which globalization has led to a, a world of you know, 7 billion people where we always think, well, there's somebody else who's already thought of this problem, or it's an impossibly hard problem. So there's sort of the sense that the world is this very flat place where you're not going to be the one to discover it. And I think, I think that's sort of an intuition that, uh, that one always should try to, try to resist. So second, um, second uh, um, somewhat contrarian idea is that I think there are still uh, many, many secrets left, and therefore uh, there are many th um, great things to be discovered, many great businesses to be built. Um, third, um, third uh, somewhat uh, uh, um, unconventional truth that I want to uh, sort of frame is, and this one's, this one's sort of a little bit bigger picture. Um, I, think that, uh, I think that in the 21st century, there will be two, two modes of, uh, two modes of progress. Um, one I sort of describe as globalization, copying things that work, going from one to n, horizontal or extensive growth. Um, and I always draw that on an x-axis. And the other one is technology, vertical progress, uh, discovering new things, going from zero to one. And I draw that sort of on a y-axis. And I, I always put globalization on the x-axis and technology on a y-axis in order to underscore how these things are not synonyms, even though they get used almost synonymously and interchangeably all the time. You know, China today is sort of the paradigm of globalization. It has a very straightforward plan for the next 20 years. It just must copy things that work from you know, the US and Western Europe and Japan. It can skip a few steps uh, and, and can avoid copying some, some of our bad ideas. Um, but it, it's, um, it's just sort of 
straightforwardly all about globalization. Um, and I think, um, but, I, and, but I think when you sort of look over the last 200 years, um, there have been periods of globalization, periods of technology, and they've sort of been um, somewhat different in character. The, the 19th century was a period of enormous globalization and technological progress. They sort of went, went in tandem. Um, it sort of came to an end in 1914 with the First World War. Globalization sort of started to go in reverse. There was less trade, less connections between different, uh, different parts of the world. Technology kept going uh, very, very fast. Um, and then I would argue after 1971, when, when Kissinger went to China, uh, globalization started again in earnest. Um, but we've, in, in the last 40 or so years, I would argue, lived in a period of somewhat slow technological progress, where it's been a lot in computers, not so much elsewhere. And so the, uh, whereas the 19th century had both globalization and technology, the last 100 years have been characterized by first a period of um, enormous technological progress, but um, less globalization, uh, 1914 to 1971. And then secondly, a more recent period with, um, with lots of uh, globalization, but somewhat less technology. And um, these two different periods were uh, characterized by very different ways that we talk about the world. So in the, um, in the 1950s or 1960s, you would have described the world as consisting of the first world and the third world. The first world was that part of the world where uh, progress was happening. The third world was that part that was just sort of permanently screwed up. Um, whereas today we would talk about the developing and the developed world. Um, and the developing countries are those that are copying the developed world. And so this dichotomy of developing and developed is sort of a pro-globalization convergence theory of history where everybody will uh, become more alike as, as globalization proceeds apace. But it is also a dichotomy that is somehow, I, I find, to be anti-technological. Because when we say that we're living in the developed world in the US, Western Europe, Japan, um, we are implicitly saying that we're living in that part of the world where nothing new is going to happen, which is done, which is finished, which should be resigned to um, uh, a long period of stagnation, where um, the younger generation should not expect to be uh, living lives any better than their parents. And I think, um, I think this is a conception we should resist very, very strenuously. We should, not accept, um, we should not accept this label that we're living in the developed world. And I think, uh, I think we should instead ask uh, anew, um, how do we go about uh, developing the so-called developed world? Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. I want to remind you, if you haven't asked a question through the hashtag Teal Stanford, you still can. Uh, I'm going to get the ball rolling here, but Peter's agreed to take some questions from the group. Just submit them by, by Twitter, and uh, I'll, I'll ask them. Thank you for being with us. Uh, I wanted to start with your, your, what you had to say up here and in the book about secrets. And uh, it's, a, it's a very admirable admonition to work on those problems that are solvable but are very hard to solve, or discoveries that are, can be discovered but are hard to discover. And I guess I'm wondering, are, are there things educational institutions can do to encourage people to work at those problems rather than competing, competing along conventional lines? And is there something individuals can do to, be, to force themselves to think in the way you're saying we should think? Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, even though I, I, don't have all, I don't have an idea on how to reform all the existing education institutions, and, um, and uh, I, would, I would say on an individual level, I think it is always, uh, it's always really good if, if there's something that you're incredibly passionate about and, um, and just sort of are fine to be intrinsically interesting and, uh, and that, that people pursue that. Um, and so the, you know, one of, the, one of the, the, the resolutions I came up with um, a number of years ago was to always uh, um, value substance over status, substance over prestige. Um, and uh, you know, if, if I sort of was giving my younger self advice on what to what to do or how to how to think about um, your one's one's life, I you know I probably I, I think I you know um, I, I probably would still go to Stanford. 
um, you know, I, I might still go to law school. Um, but I'd, I'd ask, I'd ask sort of, I'd ask a lot more questions why, why I was doing these things. And I think, uh, I think if I was honest about it, too much of it was driven by, um, by prestige and status, and not quite enough about um, really the substance of, uh, of trying to learn things. And you know, the, I had sort of this, I sort of just think of it as this sort of crazy rolling quarter life crisis and sort of culminated in this, uh, in this you know, big New York law firm where you know, from the outside everybody wanted to get in, from the inside everybody wanted to get out. Um, you know, um, after, I, I lasted seven months and three days and after, uh, um, and uh, when, I, when, I, when I left, one of the people down the hall said, you know, it's so reassuring to see you leave, Peter. I had no idea it was possible to escape from Alcatraz, <laughs> which, which again, uh, and, you know, and again, I, and all you had to do was go through the front door. But our identity, um, people's identities get so wrapped up in um, the things they compete for that it was inconceivable for people to actually do that. And, and then the question was, you know, well, how had I ended up there? Why, why had I not thought about that more? And, uh, and I think it was um, that I had taken too many of these shortcuts of valuing sort of what was prestigious, what was conventional over what I, uh, what I really wanted to do. So I think, I think always substance over status. Can we talk about one of your contrarian thoughts, uh, capitalism and competition are antonyms. Uh, why do you think people resist that? You convinced me. Why do other people resist that, do you think? Um, why is that a? Conventionally wrong. Well, it's um, it's uh, it's still it's it's always um, whenever whenever I present this as an idea, it still always seems to be news to people to some extent. Or um, and there's sort of are there are all these things that get obscured in in very different ways. So um, you know uh, we've um, there's sort of a um, one one of the strange uh, dynamics vis-a-vis. Um, -vis, uh, uh, at, at Google, for example, I'll, I'll, I don't, I don't want to really pick. I'm, I'm picking on Google because I think it's in some, some way such a great company. But the, sort of our all these um, um, all these ways we could could learn from it. But you have sort of all these super talented people at Google, and um, they've had a remark. It's been a remarkably small number of them who have succeeded in starting new companies. So there have not been that many great companies that have come out of Google. Even though you have like twenty or thirty thousand super talented people there, and um, and you know what? What the people inside Google are told is, "You're everything's going great because we have such talented people." It's you know, um, people are talented. We're never rewarded enough, and so when people come out of that and start a start a business, they conclude, "Okay, it's just about getting some really smart people." It has nothing to do with the business strategy or the plan, um, because that sort of got obscured, and so um, and so there are sort of so you talk about talent when you don't want to talk about monopoly. Um, or some, something like that. And so I think there are all these contexts where people, um, people just, uh, just don't talk about it. I'm sure a lot of people in the room would love to hear you talk about things you're thinking about investing in or you have. No proprietary information, obviously, but what's, what's interesting right now in the startup world? Would you have a, if you had a crystal ball, could you tell us what you think is going to be the big developments of the coming, I don't know, five to 10 years? So let's see. So I, 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 I always. Whenever people ask about like what are the themes that are going to happen, I'm always skeptical of themes because again, once you have a theme, you have quite a number of different companies in that theme, and so if, like you had a theme of you know online pet food companies, you don't want to be the you know, the fourth online pet food company, and you don't want to be the you know tenth uh, thin film solar panel company in the last decade, and you don't want to be the twentieth uh, pizza restaurant in Palo Alto or something like that. So um, so I, I, I find myself to be quite skeptical of just about all the themes people talk about because they have this sort of undifferentiated feel. So it's like education software, healthcare IT, these are sort of you know, really overwrought themes. Or um, big data, cloud computing, um, not even clear what those words mean, really, really overdone. Um, SaaS computing, really overdone. Um, and uh, what, what I think works really well are sort of one of a kind companies where where people are sort of on a um, on a mission to do something where if they didn't work on it it wouldn't happen elsewhere. You know, one of my one of my colleagues from uh, PayPal, Elon Musk, started you know Tesla and and SpaceX. You know, SpaceX, they, they we were on a mission to go to Mars, and that's how we sort of got a lot of 
great rocket scientists to start, and, and that is really, they really are on a mission uh, to, go to go to Mars. And you could say, well, is there a theme of companies going to Mars? Not, not, <laughs> it's somehow, no, it's just, it's just, it's just sort of this, this unique uh, one of a kind thing. And, and I think, so I think a lot of the companies I'm excited about have aspects like that. We're large investors in Airbnb. It has, um, you know, people have tried to frame it as a sharing economy theme, but it's, I think it's really, again, just a one of a kind company about helping free up some, you know, inventory and housing, expanding the tourism market. It sort of does something that's, that's, that's very unique in that, in that sort of a way. So let me ask you one last question about secrets. Um, you, you sort of applied the theory of secrets to a whole different area than business development and innovation. This is from your chapter, uh, chapter eight. On some level, every form of injustice involves a secret. Something is being done, it's unjust, it's happening because society allows it to happen. The majority of people don't understand the injustice of it. Invariably, that's understood only by a small minority. Is there an important injustice today that you think only a small group of people recognize? Um, well, yes, it doesn't mean I can tell you what it is, <laughs> okay. but, um, but certainly, um, certainly uh, there'd be two different attitudes you could have. One would be that, um, yeah, there were all, in the past we know there were all sorts of injustices. Today we've found, discovered all of them, therefore there are none left, which would put us in a very odd point that there would be no hidden injustices left. Um, and so I'm much more inclined to think that we're not at the end of history and um, that there are still, um, you know, there still are uh, secrets about justice left and secrets about injustices that are going on. I can, you know, I can uh, speculate on, on some of them. Um, they, 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 will always, they will always sound weird when you sort of put them forward because these are things people may not, uh, may not uh, fully, uh, fully appreciate or understand. But um, I think, you know, if, if people are looking back from the year 2100 on 2014 and they'll say, you know, what was really crazy about the way things were organized in 2014. Uh, I, I think one of the things people will say was really crazy is that so many of the political leaders and business leaders were sociopaths. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to know sort of quite how, how borderline, you know, not like not totally non-functioning, right. but sort of these, these, borderline, uh, these borderline sociopaths. And, um, and that, that will be, you know, that'll be quite, quite extraordinary. You know, the stuff that's sort of like right on the cusp, you know, um, this is like more medical, but you know, people in the 1960s knew that smoking was bad, even though it wasn't quite there. You sort of suspect football is sort of like where smoking was in the early 1960s. We sort of sense that it's, it's a really bad idea, that it does a lot of, you know, a lot of brain damage, but, um, but it hasn't yet quite gotten articulated. So I think there are sort of a lot of things like this that will be really different in, you know, decades ahead. So one last question on that. How do you fight against conventional thinking? Um, well, it's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm never sure that there's like a shortcut formula. I, I certainly think being aware of how, how prone we all are to it is, um, is very important. You know, I, when, I, when I ask this question, tell me something that's true as an, as an interview question, the answers are normally just really bad. Um, but, but, but sort of one, one kind of answer that's always a little bit better than average is if you sort at least acknowledge that it's a bad answer and you don't know better. So if you say, um, well, I think there need to be more education software companies, that's a bad answer because everyone understands education should be fixed and things should be, should be changed. Um, but if you say, um, well, I think there should be more education software companies, and I know this is not a very original answer, um, at that point, you're already way ahead because you're at least aware of how unoriginal you are, and um, <laughs> and I think um, and so I, th I think that's uh, um, and so I think it's always you know the the flip answer I, another flip answer I always give this question is people always think that originality is easy it's incredibly hard it's ex incredibly rare um, and um, and we should never lose sight of how much we we're influenced by the society around us you know it's like it's like advertising where we, we always think um, it's amazing how all these ads work on other people, but we're, we think for ourselves, we're not influenced by them. And by the way, that's what everybody else also thinks about advertising, which somehow suggests it doesn't quite add up. Right. Well, let me ask you some of these questions from the crowd here. Uh, 
There's a question about the Teal Fellowships. You're, I think, are you five years into the fellowships? We're starting the fifth year. Starting the fifth year. At the end of this year, yes. Do you have uh, an assessment of whether they're successful so far? Is it too early to tell? What kind of metrics are you thinking about as you evaluate what you're doing? You know, I, th I think it's, um, yeah, so it was, it was this, uh, it was a sort, sort of somewhat unconventional program to give uh, um, 20, uh, 20 people, 20 students, uh, um, a two-year stipend to uh, stop out of school, work on a, a business or some nonprofit or some other uh, project that they, they would be interested in. Uh, we've, it's, it's sort of, um, you know, I, we've had basically 83 people go through the program at this point. Uh, I think it's been a you know, very powerful experience for almost all the people in it. They, they've learned a lot. You know, some have gone back to college. So the, the first year we had 24, five ended up going back to school um, sort of two years ago when, when that ended. Um, uh, but then, you know, a number of others have started some pretty successful companies. We've um, raised about 60 million uh, in venture capital in aggregate. So it's, it's been, you know, it's been, um, it's been quite successful, sort of getting more applicants each year. We've sort of built out some peripheral programs, you know, summit series for younger entrepreneurs to, to get involved. Um, but it really has captured a, a lot around the zeitgeist. Um, I think it, um, you know, one of the things that was not expected was how much of a debate it would trigger around education. Because, you know, I'm not, you know, it's always, you always get sort of portrayed as this person who's against uh, all college or something like this. And, and my, my perspective is, uh, is just that there should not be a one-size-fits-all approach. And so it's, it's again, the, 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 the real problem with higher education is that it's too tracked, it's too conventional. You know, if we say that you go to Yale or you go to jail, that's, that's not the way we really want our society to be structured. We want, we want there to be you know, many different kinds of options people, uh, people uh, can pursue. And I think, um, and I was, and, I, and so I think uh, the program generated a tremendous amount of debate and discussion because um, people do sense that there's something odd about how, how hyper-tracked things are. And uh, there are many cases where you know, people amass huge amounts of student debt. Um, and then it's not, it's not clear. It limits their career choices in all these different ways. And so there are sort of a lot of questions like that people, people are asking. You'll have to forgive me for this question, but there are six people asking it. So I, uh, did you learn anything in law school that you thought was helpful to your later <laughs> career? Or what was the most important thing you learned in law school that was, was helpful? Well, I, I think, there are, I think there, are, uh, there are a lot of things that, uh, that, um, that I learned. Um, I'll give, I'll give two, um, two, two things that apply in this startup entrepreneurial world. Um, one part that I'm always... Um, very focused on is sort of the structure of these companies and how, how well are people aligned. And so you can, um, and uh, making sure that people are you know, aligned properly, not just that they say they are. I think this is sort of a very, a very legal kind of a framework to think about what are people's incentives, you know, are they going to be aligned or not. And, and I think you want to both have formal alignment where you set the structure right, and you want to have um, informal alignment where the people would naturally try to work together well in one, one way or another. Um, and I, th I think that somehow tends to get obscured in all these other ways. Um, you know, there's always a, there's always a, uh, there's always a prehistory question I like to ask founders of, of companies, which is um, how did you, uh, how did you um, meet, what's the prehistory of the company before you got started? Um, and I find that to be a really instructive uh, set of questions to ask. A bad answer is something like, you know, we met a week ago at a social networking function, at a business networking function. We decided to start a company because we both wanted to be entrepreneurs. Um, you know, that's like saying, I, I married the first person I met at the slot machines in Las <laughs> Vegas. And you might hit the jackpot, but it's probably a really bad idea. Um, and a much better answer is, you know, we've been talking about this for a long time, you know, maybe one of us is more on the tech side, the other one's more on the business side. We have these sort of complementary skills. And, uh, and so I think this question of um, alignment and structure is, um, is incredibly important. I would say um, non-lawyers in, um, in business, and again, most, you know, most people in business are not lawyers, but um, I think they sort of tend to make one of, um, one of two mistakes. Um, um, uh, they either think of the law as irrelevant, or they think of the law as all important. And, um, and those are both sort of 
pretty, uh, and, and so if you think of the law as irrelevant, um, you end up just breaking lots of laws and you get into trouble pretty quickly. Um, and if you think it's all important, um, you probably end up, uh, you, you can very easily sort of get uh, at a point where you just um, get handicapped by the law and you, you stop from, it stops you from doing anything. And so I think, I think that having sort of an intermediate perspective on it as, um, as critical but not all important is actually a, a really valuable perspective to have. A, a lot of questions have been provoked by your discussion of monopoly, and uh, a lot of questions here are about, does this, your, your view about monopoly, does it suggest anything about innovation policy? Uh, one way to put the question is, is, is Google now AT&T? Should it, should it be broken up? Can the monopoly be too big? And do you have views about when it is too big? Uh, yeah, so there's always a uh, there's always a political or uh, question. So from the from the inside, monopoly is always a good idea. From the outside, that's it's much more debatable. Um, and um, and I would say the the, the basic uh, distinction I give is that um, I think monopolies deserve the bad reputation they have in a static world where nothing changes, because that's where the monopoly uh, is just a rent collector or a tax collector of one sort or another. Um, artificially restrict supply, um, and that's sort of a bad monopoly. Um, a good monopoly is one that actually has invented something new. So when Apple came up with the, uh, with the iPhone, um, it was the first smartphone that worked. And so it, for many years, had a monopoly on smartphones. I would argue it still actually has it with the brand and with you know, a lot of the network effects that's built up around it. Um, and that's, um, that's a, in a dynamic context, that's a monopoly that actually creates, um, you know, uh, doesn't create scarcity, but creates like an, a whole new thing. So it's, you know, people are lining up to get iPhones because they didn't even exist before. And, um, and so that, I think that's a, that, that's a, uh, that's a good one. Um, and, uh, and so then there's always a question, you know, so I, I'd say the question is how static is technology at this point? Um, I would say, I think the government has gotten it wrong historically. So, you know, we went after um, IBM in the 70s, just as things were going from hardware to software anyway. Um, you know, I think, and people can debate this history, but I think we went after Microsoft in the late 90s when it was all going to shift to the internet anyway, and there's no reason to think Microsoft would have dominated the internet in the same way they dominated the desktop. So I think very often the intervention's been somewhat too late, and I I'm, I'm also would be skeptical of the EU um, intervention on, on, um, on Google at this point, which you know, I think people are underestimating in Silicon Valley, and there's a sense that that's, that's building up. So we have a couple questions about secrets and disclosure, uh, your, your idea of what a secret is and how we should be pursuing it, and what is the relationship between that and when it can be disclosed. When can companies disclose their secrets? Should they do that? What's the, what's the wise thing to do? Well, um, well you know, I, I, I suppose uh, sort of just to... You know, one, one, one framework is, you know, if you, if you have a secret, um, it's, on the one hand, if you tell nobody about it, it doesn't do anybody any good at that point, or there's not much you can do with it. Um, and if you tell everybody about it, maybe, maybe that's, um, you know, maybe that's, uh, maybe that, that ends up diluting it in all these ways. And so I, I actually often, uh, I, in some ways, I define a company as a group of people who have a secret, um, or a, a great company, you have, uh, and that's actually what defines, and it's just, so it's, you tell just the right number of people, and that's the people in the company or, or working on a, on a particular project. Um, I am, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical about how well, you know, we certainly have patent laws um, and sort of all these sort of laws that give you legal monopolies in secrets you discover. Um, they don't, I don't think they work all that well in practice. But, uh, but I think sort of the idea behind them is a good one. And so you always want to think about how do you, how do you um, preserve your secret in a way that's valuable for, for, for quite a long time. I have a question here you can decline, uh, but um, a request that you expand your recent comments about Twitter that you made on CNBC. Well, it's... Um, you, it's, you know, there always are uh, all these uh, sensitive microphones all over the place um, in our um, hyper-media-saturated uh, and Twitter-saturated society. Um, but um, I, I, I had made some comments to the effect that um, I thought it was a 
rather mismanaged company. Um, I, I said something like, you know, that maybe there was a lot of marijuana smoking going on. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the CEO, in, in, in Dick Costello, in very good humor, uh, did uh, tweet, uh, tweet back that uh, he didn't have time to respond since he was busy eating a large bag of Doritos. <laughs> um, but um, but, um, but the, uh, the, the context in which I put it was that, uh, was that, um, that um, I think Twitter's actually a fantastic business. You know, they have a fantastic core idea. And, um, and one of the things that is true of these uh, monopoly-like businesses is you don't have to be operationally that airtight. And so, um, and so uh, you know, the 140 character idea was a really good one. It took off like crazy. Um, um, nobody else could catch, catch you once you had it. You could tell people about it, but then you know, so many people cop, um, uh, adopted it that uh, you, you ended up as the leading company. And so when you have a, a great monopoly business like Twitter, um, you often um, don't have to be run all that uh, operationally well. And so that's, that's sort of the, that's sort of the, the context. Whereas if you're, if you're opening a restaurant, you have to be operationally super tight on everything. I have a couple of questions about uh, the influence of libertarian philosophy on your thinking today and over the course of your, your life? Well, um, well, I describe myself as, uh, as uh, libertarian in that you know, I'm um, socially liberal, fiscally more, more conservative. Um, I, you know, I think it, um, temperamentally I'm more of a political atheist though in that I, I just don't believe that the uh, political system is the place where we solve our problems. And so I, I, you, you get sort of caught up into these, in these political debates. Um, and, I, uh, and while on the one hand, I always believe that there are certain ways that would be better than others, um, realistically, I actually don't think things will change that much. And that's why I end up focusing way more on, on technology as a way to change things than, um, than politics. Um, one of the, you know, there, there is sort of um, one m mode of uh, the libertarian uh, stuff where it's, it's just you say these are just these timeless and absolute truths. Um, and I don't think that's, that's not quite the way I think about it. I think, um, I think that it somehow is more true today than it was, um, it was in the past. And, uh, and you know, that, for example, then again, the question I'm always most interested in is technology, science, how do we have more technology, how do we have science innovation, and then the, a political version of that question is, could the government be doing more to foster these things? And, um, and I think um, the sort of nuanced answer is, it, uh, it actually did a lot more in the past, and it seems much less capable of doing things today. And so, you know, you had a Manhattan project where you build a nuclear bomb in three and a half years. You had, um, and you know, the, the New York Times op-ed a few days after Hiroshima was sort of anti-libertarian. It was sort of, this proves how much uh, faster the science can happen when the government, uh, led by the army, orders scientists what to do. And if you just let prima donna scientists do whatever they wanted, it might have taken them 50 years to come up with a bomb. Um, now, they don't write op-eds like that at the New York Times anymore. Um, um, or you have, something like, uh, you have something like the Apollo program in the 1960s where and you have a sense you could not do a Manhattan Project, you could not do Apollo today, you know. Um, and uh, and so I, I do think that there is this uh, really odd uh, question of why there has been this decline of competence um, that uh, that we should explore a lot more. Um, but given this decline, that's why I think libertarianism, in a sense, is more true because, uh, for whatever reason, the government seems capable of doing so much less than it was uh, 50 or 70 years ago. Well, there's a deep question here about whether we have a meritocracy in America, but we don't have enough time, so I'll just ask you, Star Trek, Star Wars. Um, I think you come out pretty clearly in your book on, on this. Yes, we, we are, um, uh, well, this was the, uh, the uh, well, certainly the, in the, the PayPal context uh, was that we were always uh, pro-Star Wars and anti-Star Trek because Star Trek is the uh, communist series, Star Wars is the capitalist one. In the Star Trek world, there is no money because you have the transporter technology, and it can sort of um, it can sort of create anything you want. And only sort of mentally ill people actually want to have money in the uh, in the Star Trek universe. Whereas the Star Wars world, 
the whole plot gets line is driven by you know, how Han Solo needs to pay off his debts, and so it has sort of this whole uh, money as a key driver of the plot. So if you're if you're creating if you're creating a new payment system, um, you don't want to model it too much on a on a Star Trek world. <laughs> Well, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight, and let us all thank Peter for this wonderful hour. Thank you.